Welcome back for more Saw Story. Grab a drink, take a seat, double check that you're safe, and get ready for five true scary stories found on Reddit. I grew up in a small town. Total population was maybe 2,000. Everyone knew everyone else, or at least knew your family members. It was a safe town with mostly middle class working families. Nothing major ever happened and the crime rates were low. I grew up feeling safe and secure. To note, I grew up in the 90s. One summer day, my good friend Jenny and I were out for a bike ride. We were 11 or 12 years old. We were allowed to bike anywhere we wanted as long as we didn't leave our town and we wore our helmets. There was a new road being constructed in between the two main neighborhoods. The new road was to provide a shorter way of accessing the main road to get to the next town. At the time, the road was still under construction but was nearly complete. All that was left was paving and painting. Jenny and I decided to bike down that gravel road. As we were about halfway down the kilometer long road, we noticed a man walking. He was in his early 30s and very handsome. I didn't recognize him and Jenny didn't either. As we got closer, he broke out in a big smile and said hello. We said hello back as he didn't seem threatening or scary, and he asked us if we were having a good summer and we said yes. He told Jenny and I he was a photographer from a nearby city and was in town to scout out models for his new postcard company. He said Jenny and I had beautiful features. He said everything in a very flattering way that made us feel special. He said we could be models. He asked if he could take our pictures. He said we had the look that he wanted and the scenery right now was perfect to promote the town. He said he knows he will sell tons of postcards and we could all make money. Jenny and I eagerly agreed. He got us to stand with our hands on our hips and smile big. He took a disposable camera out of his back pocket and began snapping photos. He took about 10 photos in total from many angles and I remember feeling a little uneasy and said we should probably go because we needed to be home soon. He said he would get in touch with our principal on the first day of school to give us some money from the postcard sales. We foolishly confirmed that we went to the local elementary school, though it was the only elementary school in town so it wouldn't be hard to figure it out. Neither Jenny or I remember to this day giving him our names. This is an important detail for later. Jenny and I talked about becoming famous on the way home. I told Jenny that I wondered why he didn't have a professional camera. She said she was wondering that too, but we agreed cameras are expensive, so maybe he didn't have a nice one with him in case it rained. That evening at supper, I told my parents about my potential newfound fame. They were horrified and got on the phone with Jenny's parents. The two sets of parents called police and gave statements. Police sort of downplayed it and said that it was unusual, but nothing criminal had happened. My parents had a long talk to me about safety, as did Jenny's parents with her. The following spring, Jenny and I were hanging out together, this time a little older and a little wiser and a lot more cautious. We were walking along a quiet side street, just talking about music and TV shows, when a minivan approached us and slowed down. A friendly looking woman asked us if we knew where Smith's Road was. We told her she just needed to drive straight for less than a minute and it's the first right hand turn. She said she was having difficulty finding it and would we mind hopping in and showing her. I instantly said no and Jenny also declined. Then the woman said it was okay because she knows who we are. She called us both by our first names and said she saw us on a postcard. By now we were both freaked out. We were on a stretch of the road that had no houses. The nearest one was about 100 meters away, and it wasn't common for people to have cell phones back then, so neither Jenny or I had one. The woman continued to ask us to get in her minivan. Jenny, who was normally super chatty, was staring into the vehicle intensely. Her body language was stiff, and I could tell she was scared. Suddenly, and seemingly out of nowhere, Jenny screamed, Run! I didn't know what was happening, but I ran and followed Jenny. We ran off the road, through a field, and into a yard another street over. I recognized the yard and house as belonging to a school teacher. 
We pounded on her door and she answered. We told her what happened and then Jenny said something I will never forget. She said she saw the photographer man from last summer crouching down in the very back row of seats of the van. She said she knew something bad was going to happen. Police and our parents were called. We gave statements and a vehicle description, as well as descriptions of the man and woman. Unfortunately, the police were never able to locate them, and Jenny and I never saw them again. We had some serious trust issues with strangers after those encounters, and I had nightmares of being kidnapped into early adulthood. Always make sure to teach your children that strangers are not safe, no matter how nice they are. My situation could have had a much more unfortunate outcome if things had gone even slightly differently. Those are two people I sincerely hope to never meet again. My mother-in-law was a very funny and cool woman. She and my wife were really close, but sadly she passed away when our son was about four months old. Flash forward a few years, we live in an old 1930s era craftsman house in Pasadena, California. Our son is about three at the time. I was giving him a bath one night when he started looking over my shoulder. Not at random stuff, but at something. A moment passes and he asks me why grandma calls mommy a funny name. There was a long pause. I asked him what he meant, thinking he was talking about my mom. He then says, why does grandma call mommy, using my mother-in-law's nickname for my wife? I was really set back by this. My wife and I never used the nickname. It was just what her mom called her since she was a baby. I asked him where he heard that. His reply, the farmer told me. I asked him who the farmer was, and he replied his friend. I tell my wife the story later, and she's of course reduced to tears over the whole nickname thing. We both know there is no way for him to know this, and we just kinda marvel at it. Flash forward to the next weekend, and my son is playing in his room. My wife is at work, where she works retail, and I'm at home for the weekend. I hear him start talking like he's having a conversation. He's saying things like, yes, no, I don't know that, then some laughing. I go into his room and ask him what he's doing, and he says playing. I ask with who, to which he said, the farmer. At this point, I'm already thinking about the Exorcist movie and Captain Howdy. It's a little unsettling. I ask him where the farmer is. He says that he left when I came in. What is going on? So my wife gets home, and I tell her this, and now she's just as weirded out as I am. We have no idea what to do, and figure if it happens again, we'll do something. A few days later, in the middle of the night, we both overhear our son saying the following. Grandma says you and I can't be friends anymore. So my wife and I go to check on him, both of us a little freaked. He's just sitting up in bed. I ask if he's okay, and he says yeah. Grandma says I can't play with the farmer anymore. He never once mentioned the farmer again. Not ever. He's 13 now and doesn't remember any of it. We do though. I'm a woman in my 30s who lives alone in a small house at the head of a quiet cul-de-sac in the UK. The street is a maze of roads away from the main road, which means that other than delivery guys and the occasional salesperson, you very rarely see anyone that you don't recognize. I don't exactly know all of my neighbors, but I know what they look like and I know where they live. I can recognize their cars, etc. This weirdness happened over the space of a few months several years back. I work from home, so I'm usually in, and sometimes I don't have a lot to do. The first day was one of those lazy days. It was about 4pm, and I'm sitting on the sofa watching some TV show about alien cover-ups. Someone knocked on the door. I have a surveillance camera hidden in the wooden canopy above the front door, so I checked to see who it was because I wasn't expecting any deliveries and I couldn't be bothered to deal with a salesperson. It was a woman who looked in her late 40s to early 50s very smartly dressed, like really expensive clothes and jewelry, stuff I could never afford. Most people around here generally couldn't afford it either. We're not an affluent area and this woman stuck out like a sore thumb. She looked flustered and agitated. 
glancing toward the back garden before trying to look through the tiny frosted glass window on the front door. I noticed she was carrying a dog's leash, but I didn't see a dog. At the far side of my back garden, there are two hedges. There's the hedge that I own within my property boundaries, and a second hedge outside my boundary that's council owned, along a small grassland where people walk dogs. I know for a fact there's a hole in the council owned hedge, which I've reported to the council at least a dozen times over the past decade, and they've done the square root of sod about it. Because of my hedge, I can't reach it to do anything about it myself. Consequently, when I saw the dog's leash, I thought, I bet her dog has gone through the hole. If it's a big dog, it's not getting into my garden, but if it's a small dog, it might be able to work its way through. And I've always got some cooked meat, so I figured I might be able to lure it out. I am a dog lover, so of course I want to help this woman if I can. When I was a kid, my own dog went missing for a few weeks and I thought I was never going to get him back. I was heartbroken for those weeks, but fortunately we did get him back, and ever since then I've been extremely sensitive to pets in need. I open the door and this woman gives me the weirdest look, like she was expecting someone completely different to answer the door and that I shouldn't be there. To be fair to her, my mom used to live here too, so I didn't think much of that weird look to begin with. Maybe she was expecting my mom. I say, hello, and she just stares at me for the longest 30 seconds before she tries to look past me and asks to see Margaret. I don't know what it is about other people's mistakes, but whenever someone has the wrong number, I always end up apologizing as if it's my fault, so that's what I did. Apologized and told her there was no Margaret at this address. Again, she gives me that look, only this time there's anger behind it. Yes, there is, she insists. It occurs to me at this point that I have a relative called Margaret, but she lives about 60 miles away, and I haven't seen her in years. Nonetheless, just in case she's got her addresses muddled, I ask, are you looking for Margaret, surname? But she just hisses at me. You know exactly who I'm looking for. What have you done with her? I'm absolutely lost at this point. I've lived here 20 years, and I know the name of the previous owner, so I know she's not asking for them. I also know the names of the neighbors, and the names of the people who have lived on the street in the time I've been here and since moved. None of them are called Margaret. So all I can do is tell her she's got the wrong address. She said, no, this is, and gave me my address. You're lying. That was a tad alarming. She's at the right address. She's not knocked at the wrong door. However, she clearly thinks I've done something to somebody who to the best of my knowledge has never lived here. I don't know how long the previous owner had this house, but we must be talking about at least 30 years since anyone called Margaret might have lived here. It's at this point that I notice that she subtly wrapped that dog leash around her now clenched fist, like she's planning to use it as a weapon. In my youth, I did plenty of self-defense training, so I'm not exactly scared of her as such, but I'm obviously getting a bit concerned about the situation that's brewing. I don't particularly wish to get involved in a brawl on my doorstep with a complete stranger. I'm torn between shutting the door in her face or trying to de-escalate the situation. In the end, I close the door a little so she's got less to aim at and tell her, Look, I don't know who you're looking for, but if you think something's happened to your friend, maybe we should just call the police and let them sort it out. Sure enough, the woman slams her fist with the leash wrapped around it into my door. I later discovered she'd struck the door hard enough to crack the frosted glass window in the middle of it. She's bleeding from doing it. It must have hurt, but she doesn't flinch or show any sign of pain. What the hell? Any confidence I had in my self-defense classes started to waver here because I'm not used to people who don't feel pain. All I can think now is that she's on something and having a really bad trip. So at this point, I put on my scariest voice and tell her to get back. I let her know I'm calling the police and if she's still here when they get here, she can deal with them because I'm not dealing with her anymore. She tries to stop me from closing the door but I shove her back and manage to get it closed and locked. I make a point to stand next to the door while I'm calling the police so she can hear me. 
While I'm waiting for the police to turn up, I watch her on the surveillance feed. She moves out of shot multiple times, presumably to check the back of the house, and I hear her calling out for Margaret. A few minutes before the police finally turn up, I see her kick over my trash bins in a rage. But then, the most chilling thing happens. She walks back to the front door and literally stares directly into my camera. That camera is pretty well hidden. I'm not saying nobody could spot it, but most people would only know it was there if they had been looking for it. Most people aren't looking for cameras, right? She knew it was there. She must have eyeballed it previously. When? I don't know. I later reviewed all the footage I had from that day, and she had never made eye contact with it once. She never even looked in that direction. While she's staring right into it, she flips me the finger and then makes a throat-cutting gesture before walking off. I head to the window to watch her leave, and she's walking like she doesn't have a care in the world. She doesn't look back, just wanders away. The police finally show up, take a statement, I give them a copy of the surveillance footage, and that's that. I called a couple of times to follow up, but nothing. Nobody ever called me about it. I won't lie, this scared me for a few weeks. I moved the knife block closer to the door, though out of sight of any of the windows. I started staying up really late and not getting much sleep, which really didn't help. Every time I heard the gate open, it would put me on edge. I'd review the surveillance footage every day. Eventually, as the weeks passed and I hadn't heard anything else, I started to regain some of my comfort and just put it down to a weird experience. It didn't last. About four, maybe five weeks after the first encounter, she came back. It was just after midnight. I was in the living room mucking about on my phone with the TV on low volume for some background noise. I heard a car door slam and peeked out the front window. A dark colored car was parked at the end of my driveway. I couldn't see what make or model it was, but it looked like some sort of estate car. I didn't see anyone moving about, but a minute or two later, the front gate swung open with its metallic groaning and there was a knock on the door. Even when I'm not involved in a blood feud over imaginary margarettes, I'm not going to answer the door at that time. I check the surveillance camera. Its night vision mode is pretty bad, but I'm positive it's that woman again. I can even see what I think is the dog's leash. And of course, she knows I'm watching her, because she looks at the camera again, and I tell you, when someone is already giving you the heebie-jeebies, the way night vision makes people's eyes look like soulless black voids doesn't do much to make you feel better. Suddenly, she yells out, Shut that racket off and come out here now! I had the TV on, but as I mentioned, it was on very low volume. There's no way she could hear it from outside the front door. I couldn't even hear it when I walked into the hallway. I'm convinced at this point she's mentally unwell, so I call the police again. I want them to stay on the line, but they just tell me that someone will be over soon and to call them back immediately if things escalate. So I'm waiting, watching, just hoping she doesn't start trying to smash a window or something. She kicks over my trash bins again and yells something else out, which I couldn't quite make out. But whatever it was, it was enough for one of my neighbors to come and investigate. I watched the neighbor talking with her for a minute. She's going on about something, wagging her finger towards my front door, but my neighbor is eventually able to get her to leave. He even sticks around for a bit to make sure she's gone. Sadly, that also means she'd be gone before the police turned up again. Another statement, handing over more security footage, more nothing. I caught up with the neighbor the next day, and he apologized because it didn't occur to him to make a note of the registration plate, but he told me that she'd said much the same thing as she said to me previously, that she wanted to know where Margaret was and what I'd done with her. I'm grasping for answers at this point. Even if she's mentally unwell, the fact she's sticking to this Margaret story and has the right address makes me think there's something more to this than someone having a breakdown. Then it clicks. Is Margaret her dog? Does she think that I've stolen her dog? It would be another few weeks before she came back, this time at 3am. I'm awoken by a knocking at the door. A few minutes later, I hear tapping on the bedroom window. I know it's her. I can hear her saying things, but I can't really make them out because they're too muffled through the window. It's like she didn't want to get the neighbors out again, so she's trying to keep it quiet. 
I jump out of bed and put on clothes as quickly as I can. I try and follow her as she moves around the outside of the house from room to room, knocking, tapping, and muttering. I think I hear a few coherent words like noise, racket, and calling me names. I can't check the surveillance footage this time because she spray painted the lens. Not that it'd matter much this time, she's not lingering by the front door. I think about calling the police again, but it's proven a waste of time so far, and I get the feeling if I call them out a third time and she's gone, they might start accusing me of wasting their time even if I do have evidence. They've not exactly been helpful so far. In the end, I wait by the front door and listen for her. Eventually she knocks again and I call out, Is Margaret your dog? Dead silence. Nothing. I can't see anything through the frosted glass because it's too dark. I have no idea where she is, and I don't want to turn the outside lights on. I don't even know why. She knows I'm in the house because I've called out to her, but I still don't want to draw more attention to myself. I end up standing there for who knows how long, at least an hour, probably more because the sun starts coming up. My heart is going a mile a minute pretty much the whole time. Once it's bright enough, I start checking through the windows to see if I can see her. Nope. Nothing. I tentatively open the front door and look outside. Still can't see her. I grab something to arm myself with just in case, and check all around my house and the back garden. She's not there. As I'm heading back to the front door, I spot the oddest thing. The gate's closed. That gate is physically attached to the side of my house, and when it opens and closes it makes a fair bit of noise. You'd definitely hear it if someone opened or closed it when you were standing next to the front door. But it's closed, so what does that mean? Did she jump it somehow? It's possible, I guess, but I wouldn't want to try it. Anyway, I open the gate and head out to the end of the driveway. I look around and there's no sign of anyone. I turn back to the house and see she spray painted a liar on the front of my house and left the dog leash on the floor beneath it. That was, thankfully, the last time I ever heard from or saw this woman again. Ever since all this happened, I get these creeped out feelings occasionally at night and check out the window. I don't know whether I'm imagining it or what, but now and again I swear I see a dark colored estate car out on the street, not parked at the end of my driveway these days, but I just can't shake the feeling she's in there, watching my house. I grew up in a house on Long Island in the town of Brentwood. It was a quiet town for its location. My dad worked as a taxi driver, which meant he would usually end up coming home early in the morning and I would greet him. So it's Saturday, I'm watching my cartoons, and my dad comes in, so I run to say hello. My mom hears us from the bedroom and says, Hello honey, don't go in the pool, it's not ready yet. Me and my dad think, well that's weird, it's 6am, we weren't going to go in the pool. But just brush it off, and he goes on to tell me his usual stories of the crazies he had picked up throughout the night. We then realized it was Saturday, and my mom was at work. It was only me and him in the house, but the voice sounded just like my mother. Fast forward a couple of weeks. We had just moved into the house, and my new neighbors came over to welcome us to town. It was the two mothers, two sons, one my age, one a little older, and two little girls, a blonde haired girl, and a shy brunette that didn't talk. We get to playing some soccer, however the little brunette girl is nowhere to be found. The curious little kid I was, I ran around the property and I found her playing in the woods, a dangerous area for little nooblets to be exploring. She asked me to come and play tag, but I declined, wanting to get everyone in on the game. The reactions of everyone as I asked for them to join us was puzzling, along with the response from their mother, we only have one daughter. It turns out the small brown haired girl had drowned in the pool 10 years ago and the mother soon passed from a heart attack. The following 5-6 to six years was terrifying for everyone. I'll share another thing that happened. So I've been living in this house for a little while now. Pretty spooky things have happened, but nothing as bad as when I first moved in. I'm coming back from school one day, and if I recall correctly I was in the 7th grade. My parents and brother were all out, so I was home alone. I went and fixed myself up some food and watched some TV. 
Eventually, I got bored, so I went outside to play some basketball by myself, and not soon after, I heard a door slam. The yard was enormous, but it was a small house with big windows and white transparent curtains. I just assumed the sound was my brother getting back, so I looked through the pale curtains, and I can make out a figure walking through the house. However, I could not guess who it was. As I get to the driveway, you have to wrap around the side to get into the house. I noticed that there were no cars parked, which meant no one was home. Maybe my brother had gotten a ride back? But where would he leave his car? Surely he never let it leave his side. Approaching the front door, I realized it was locked. I had left it open specifically so I could get back in. As I wriggle the doorknob, I hear hurried footsteps head to the door, slowly turning into a sprint, in which they stop, right at the welcome rug on the inside. I just stand there, petrified, until my brother pulls up. I tell him what happened, and he goes and gets his iron bat from practice, and we make our way into the house. Not a single thing in the entire house, nothing, was disturbed, and had been left the same exact way I left it. However, that's not the most disturbing part. My brother didn't even use his key to get in, which meant the door was open all along. I'm a psychiatric nurse, and early in my career, I worked at a residential mental health facility. One of our residents was an elective mute, which means that he didn't, wouldn't, or couldn't talk, but there were no medical reasons as to why. He had spoken earlier in his life, and in fact seemed quite normal back then, with the exception of being close to seven feet tall. He'd been raised in the deep south, and joined the military when he was 19, but one night he vanished. He was declared AWOL, and eventually declared missing and dead. Ten years later, a seven foot tall man walked into a VA hospital emergency room in my part of the Midwest and said to the receptionist, My name is Marion Duchene, and I've been dead for ten years. This wasn't his real name, but those were the last words he ever spoke. He was covered with dust, and wearing the same clothes he'd been reported to be wearing the night he vanished. His social security number had not been used, and he had no identification on his person. However, they were able to identify him, presumably via fingerprints. The family was notified, but they said they had already grieved their lost man, and that whomever was claiming to be him simply could not be. They demanded not to be contacted again. Marion paced all day, every day, moving his mouth in which what looked like talking or muttering, but no sound came out. He had an unnerving habit of throwing his head back with his mouth wide open as if he were laughing heartily, but not even a breath could be heard. I talked to him, and he appeared to listen, periodically throwing his head back in that laughter-mimicking way of his. Various medications were tried, but they did not affect him either positively or negatively. Occupational therapy did nothing, because Marion would just grin, and unless told to stay put, he'd get up and start pacing again. On my last day at that job, the last thing I saw was Marion pacing in the parking lot, throwing his head back to laugh. Later, I wondered if all along I'd been dealing with a ghost. All these years later, I still don't know. Thank you for watching True Scary Stories from Reddit. Comment below which of these stories was your favorite. If you enjoyed today's video, please drop a like on it, and if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe for more. Hit the bell icon to be notified when new videos go live. That's all for today. Till next time, stay safe out there, and I'll see you on the next one.